Good afternoon, colleagues. And uh, I'm wondering what the, uh, what the end point is here if you go over your time. Maybe it's one of those James Bond style ejector buttons uh, that, that will send, send you flying. Uh, thanks. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, Lou, and uh, fellow panelists. I'm going to be the techno peasant on the panel this afternoon, so you will not be subjected to, um, to any PowerPoints. And then we're going to upgrade uh, once I'm done, okay? And then you, you, you're going to get all those glitchy stuff. So it's, uh, it's quite a mouthful, uh, value proposition, incentives, innovative models, uh, multi-sectoral engagement in global health. I'm going to frame this uh, from the purview, largely, not exclusively, largely from the purview of what we do uh, in the World Bank group. And the operative word there is actually group, because it covers both the classic World Bank and also the International Finance Corporation, or the IFC, uh, which is our frank private sector uh, wing. So, I'm going to cover the whole spectrum, or I shall try to cover the whole spectrum this afternoon. And when I'm placing, one, uh, placing emphasis on one or the other, I will, uh, I will say so. Uh, you may think of us as uh, a combination of the kinder, gentler World Bank on uh, 18th Street, and then the benevolent uh, IFC, which is a very kind private sector wing. Okay? It's that kind of day. Um, I'm in a very kind mood. <coughs> so what is the motivation? I think let's start from square one. Um, we know that in many countries, uh, there are very large uh, gaps in coverage with essential health services, particularly for the poor and marginalized, uh, for, for the poor and the marginalized. You also recall that half of the world's population uh, cannot access the needed health services. We know that some 100 million people every year are pushed into extreme poverty uh, because of health expenditures. And in addition, some 800 million folks spend at least 10% uh, or more of their household budget on health expenditures, which often forces them uh, to choose between their health and other needed expenses uh, for their family. As if uh, those weren't bad enough, uh, in many places, if the health services are available, uh, you find that in many countries at all levels of development, uh, the quality often is not assured. And this is the year in which we've had an epidemic of uh, reports on quality of care, uh, one from the National Academies itself, another one from WHO and the World Bank, and one from the Lancet Commission on High Quality Health Systems, of which I happen to serve as as commissioner. When you put all of this together uh, and relate it to the mission of the World Bank Group, which is dual, one being to eliminate extreme poverty and the other one being to foster shared prosperity, you begin to see why it is that we are interested uh, in this area. So, in short, the motivation is straightforward. Enabling countries to make swift progress or swifter progress towards achieving universal health coverage along its multiple dimensions with which you are very much familiar, so I'm not going to spell them out. But bear in mind coverage, quality, financial protection, and the multiple dimensions of equity. So with that in mind, what we do in the World Bank Group, remember we're talking about the combination of the, the World Bank and the IFC, is to support public policy um, that furthers uh, those objectives through both public means and private means. And here, I really want to stress this. So why? Why do you do this? Well, <coughs> I think ideological purity really has no room in this. Um, so if you have uh, a theological devotion to the public sector, this session is probably not for you. And if you have a theologic devotion to the private sector or uh, the market, this session is not for you either. Uh, why? Uh, markets fail for many reasons, uh, not the least of which is asymmetry of information. You also have moral hazard. You have adverse election. So because markets fail, there is room and there is uh, credible scope for public intervention. 
But you also have government failures, so it's not the one or the other. And for those who might insist that the market, uh, the market is God, look, I'm with Joe Stiglitz on this one. Uh, he said, the reason Adam Smith referred to it as the invisible hand is because it doesn't exist. <laughs> okay. So at the World Bank Group, uh, we also focus on the development of durable uh, country institutions as well as sustainable business models. Okay? And this is not a quest for perfection. You all, always must ask yourself, compared to what? Okay? And like the man said, don't compare me to God. Compare me to the alternative. Okay? So we have these mutually reinforcing work streams, um, and some of them are via our very basic instruments of engagement with the countries. We have something called the systematic country diagnosis, which we do. It's exactly what it says it is. And then there's a country partnership framework, which lays out over uh, a cycle of, say, about three years, what the bank business is going to be, uh, what bank group business is going to be with each, uh, with each country. And of course, a lot, a lot of sector-specific uh, studies. So for example, uh, in the World Bank alone, as of today, we, we have some $14 billion in commitments uh, at the country level. Uh, that's the size of the portfolio as of, as of today, but it keeps changing because it's, uh, it's still growing. And that, that works through some 111 operations or projects, as you know them. For the IFC, the strategy actually has three pillars. One is health service provision, including their core engagements, and also they're working through healthcare quality. Pharmaceuticals, including regional generic manufacturers and pharmaceutical retail and supply chains. And then medical devices and equipment. Uh, one of the most exciting recent developments is called the, uh, the Managed Equipment Scheme, the, the MES, which uh, they, 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 led, they, they, they enabled in Kenya with GE. And there are lessons to be learned there. Uh, again, we're not taking a theological approach to this. You learn what works, what doesn't, why, how well does it work, and where and how can it be, uh, can it be adapted. So what are some of the, uh, the things in which, we are, in which we are involved? And what are some of the criteria that we use? What are some of the, uh, the challenges that we face? Just very quickly. And then we try, to, we try to ground ourselves in the operational realities of the countries. It's not sufficient to have very elegant analytics. You need to understand the narrative of the society in which you're working. And most of the time, it's not because our counterparts don't know what to do. Uh, it's because they are very constrained by the specific political dynamics and political economy of the society in which they work. Uh, you know the U.S. has more Nobel Prize winners in economics and medicine than any other country. So if it were merely a question of technical analysis, we will lock all those folks in this room. They will come out after 30 minutes, and the Congress and the President will sign on to universal health coverage for the United States. <laughs> and so the fact that it has not happened here means that we need to have a very serious dose of humility when we get off the plane in Nicaragua or Nepal or the Philippines or Ghana and say, gee, if only the natives knew if they were smarter, they would be able to figure this out. Um, so let, let's bear that in mind, uh, tuning into the narrative uh, of, of the society. A second one is the fact that, and this is, this, this is a, a concern, I think it's, it's, it's important, there are also global narratives that, necessarily, that do not necessarily foster uh, transparency, evidence-based, uh, transparent evidence-based approaches to public-private engagement. Uh, some decade ago, uh, a few of us uh, engaged in this experiment called the Affordable Medicines Facility for Malaria. It was probably the largest uh, enterprise experimenter in global health, covered eight countries. It was spectacularly successful, evaluated in a, in a study worth $10.5 million published in The Lancet. And for reasons that are beyond the purview of a 10-minute spiel, um, it was not very well received by certain powerful elements of the global health uh, development assistance community. So I think we need to reflect on this and really ask ourselves whether we actually go with the evidence or whether, as it says in that movie, tell me the truth. And the person looked at him and said, you cannot handle the truth. That, after, that happens a lot in global development assistance. 
So lots to discuss, lots to unpack. I'm looking forward to a very spirited Q&A session. And with that, uh, I, will, I will stop here. Thank you.